we are used to seeing food only from a consumer point of view, mostly interested in satisfying our needs, or in this case, our hunger. And what I mean by that is that behind every bag of frozen vegetables, tin can of food, head of lettuce, or jar of spices, there are hundreds of people involved in the production of them. And in a cultural sense, foods are the product of thousands of years of agricultural, technological, and culinary innovation. Thankfully, there are many specialists and fields of study that helps us understand not only the technical and scientific aspects of food production, but also the uses, meanings, practices, and traditions created around them. Today, we continue exploring Mexico's cultural gastronomic staples with an episode that celebrates one of my most favorite foods, beans. You are listening to episode 67 of Paz Chipotle. I'm your host, Rocío Carvajal, food history writer, cook, and author. And on this podcast, I explore the gastronomic traditions of Mexico and bring together the voices of cooks, authors, and entrepreneurs who build cross-cultural bridges around the world, championing Mexican food. To find more information about my podcasting work, publications, and to subscribe to my newsletter, check this episode's notes or go to my website, pasachipotle.com. My friends, welcome to the first episode of 2021 and the third installment of the Cultural Staples series that explores Mexico's most culturally and gastronomically significant crops. We began this series with chiles on episode 51, followed by cocoa on episode 69, and today we continue talking about all things frijoles, beans. If you follow me on Instagram and Twitter, you'll be up to date with what is going on behind the microphone. But if you don't, well, what are you waiting for? <laughs> the update is that I'm really getting my head down working on my thesis, which at this point is finally taking shape and even has a name, which is Heritage for Whom, a revision of the dominant narratives about ritualistic food in Mexico. It is a bit of a mouthful, I know, but you can imagine that I'm juggling things at a slightly slower pace. But do not worry, episodes will continue rolling your way. And you can always spice up your podcast cravings with my other show, Hungry Books, in which I review books, well, about food. And my latest episode is a revision of a book called History of Drunkenness by Mark Forsyth, which is incredibly entertaining, knowledgeable, and very witty. And I will leave a link for you to have a listen. Now, when I was preparing this episode and reading around a dozen scholarly papers and books to do so, It dawned on me that the more essential a food is for our cuisine, the more embedded it is in our plate and habits, well, the more we take it for granted. And by consequence, the less we know and the less we are curious about its origin. Together with corn, tomatoes and chiles, beans are a part of the holy quartet of Mexico's gastronomy. Their enduring popularity as a delicious and versatile food make them synonymous with our cuisine. And, sadly, in the 20th century, also has become uh, the subject of discrimination and abusive cultural stereotypes. Yes, I basically mean the word bina, and I will touch on that later. But really, what we are here today for is to celebrate this crop and the cultural legacy built around it. And I will make sure that you finish this episode eating beans. 
This episode contains references to books and articles, some of which you can find on the notes, and the rest are on the episode's blog post on my website, pasachipotle.com. Alrighty then, get your spoons and pots ready, because we are about to get started. I hope you enjoy this episode. To say that beans have been part of Mexicans' diet for a long time, it is an understatement. And to trace the history of beans, we need to go back around 1.9 million years, when the many human migrations helped disseminate beans, along with hundreds of other plants, from one region to another. And over time, they helped carry many varieties of beans from Mexico to Central America and beyond, traveling as far as Colombia, Brazil, Ecuador, Peru and Argentina. Beans lived in the wilderness for many happy millennia, until around 16,000 years ago, five species from Mesoamerica caught the attention of the first humans that transitioned to a sedentary agricultural life. Technically, a bean is the seed of several genera of the Fabaceae or Leguminosae plant family. And while there are more than 40,000 bean varieties in the world, we are going only to focus on the genus Fastielis, which is native to Mesoamerica, where Mexico is located. Fastielis has five different species, but it's really from the Fasalis vulgaris, or common bean, from which all the cultivars that are traditionally eaten and planted here in Mexico descend from. Now, a cultivar is a production of selective breeding, meaning we have been doing analog genetic manipulation of our food literally since the dawn of all sedentary civilizations. If you have never seen a bean plant, let me try to describe it for you. It is a small plant, not taller than 1.5 meters. And except for runner beans, most cultivars need the support of other plants to curl and grow upwards. After their flowers are pollinated, they grow pods containing four or more seeds or beans that grow downwards and allow the bean to ripen while the thick skin of the pod protects the delicate seeds until they are fully developed. In Mexico, we eat an average of 9.9 kilos per capita of beans a year, and that should tell you how much we love and value them. We really don't get a chance to get bored with the more than 70 cultivars that vary in size, shape, and taste. Some popular varieties are frijol negro, bayo, mantequilla, conejo, frijol de milpa, garbancillo, ayocote, and like 53 other cultivars. As I mentioned earlier, beans constitute one of the staple crops upon which the ancestral Mexican food system and diet was built, and cultivated with its inseparable companions corn, tomatoes and chiles, they went on to inspire carefully crafted agricultural techniques, and two of them are so effective that are still used to this day. One of these techniques is known as milpa, which consists of allotments where these crops are grown together on the soil. And the other method is one that uses a hydroponic system, by which beds of soil, known as chinampas, rest on elevated beds over lakes or similar bodies of water. Beans are an extremely useful crop for the enrichment of the soil, as they return huge amounts of nitrogen back into the earth, which is very convenient since corn is a particularly nutrient-hungry plant. So as you can see, these cultivation systems not only make practical sense in terms of effort, also they are eaten together and create a perfectly balanced ecosystem. So now that you have some basic elements of the botanical credentials of beans, I want to tell you a little bit about one of the many myths of origin about them.
You see, in Mesoamerica, all ancient indigenous cosmovisions or beliefs that explained their particular views of life and the universe saw our planet, its resources, and everything that exists here as manifestations of life-giving forces. For them, the Earth as a whole was a sentient system with consciousness, feelings, and purpose. And the sacred mission of Earth was to create and sustain life. So according to these ideas, we humans exist because such life-giving forces, sometimes represented as gods or other deities, decided that the reason for our creation was to be stewards of the earth. And so, our given spiritual duty is to protect all life forms, natural resources, and even the very landscape. What our cultural rites of ancient Mexico tell us about the indigenous beliefs is how their spirituality has always been expressed as ways to honor the earth. Which, if you think of it, it really differs from other Western views, namely European civilizations, that see mankind not as a collective of custodians of nature, but as beneficiaries of it. Therefore, all life forms and resources are there simply to be exploited. And then we wonder why we need the Paris Agreements on Climate Change. Uh, anyways, one of my favorite bean myths is an obscure and fascinating tale, and this is how it goes. For the Mexica or Aztec cosmovision, at the beginning of times, there was only water, and in this sacred water, the only living creature in it was the goddess Tlaltecutli, who had the shape of an alligator. At some point, two other gods were apparently bored, and so and so Tezcatlipoca, the lord of darkness, and Quetzalcoatl, the lord of light, decided to create the earth. So far, so good. But to do so, they decided that they had to kill Tlaltecutli and split her in half. The bottom half will be the ground, and the other will be the heaven. And at this point in the story, from who knows where, a bunch of other gods came and they decided to bless her body in a way that allowed many life forms to be created from it. Trees, grass and weeds were created from her beautiful hair. From her skin, all flowers and delicate herbs appeared. Her eyes became springs of water and her mouth and nose transformed into caves and mountains. Also from her body, all edible plants were born, including, of course, the star of today's show, beans, along with chiles, amaranth, corn, squashes, sweet potatoes, and hundreds and hundreds of more plants. Eventually, when mankind was created by mixing corn masa with the blood of the gods, they were told to remember their origin and to honor the earth which is partly what explains why many agricultural rituals from the Mexica world express in many different ways all these beliefs. Therefore, agricultural ceremonies are meant to prepare the seeds to return them back to the bosom of their mother, from where the miracle of life will continue again. A few years ago, when I was researching precisely about beans, I found an intriguing ancient ritual from the month of Etzalcoalitztli, which uh, was around June in our Georgian calendar. From the Florentine Codex, we learned that during this month, a special meal called Etzali was prepared and consumed as part of rituals of fertility and abundance. Etzali was made with beans and cacao sintle corn, which has particularly large kernels, and this is the variety we still use to prepare pozole. 
it sadly wasn't reached either with the meat of Huaxolotl, that is Turkey, or the meat of Xolosquintle, which is a native Mexican hairless dog. Curiously, this dish seems to have been lost during the cultural clash that came with colonialism, and beans suffered from a very sad cultural downgrade. You see, while Spaniards really liked them and rapidly incorporated them into their diet, the fact that they were so valued by the indigenous people was reason enough for them to look them down and thus created the horrible prejudice that beans were, quote-unquote, the food of poor people. And there are two important reflections from this story. One that is very intriguing and bothersome, at least to me, that we might never know why it sadly disappeared from the festive menu, or why it didn't survive the transition, you know, with some modifications, into the colonial table, unlike many other ritualistic foods. Secondly, is that the Spaniards' double standards regarding beans that shamed both the food and the people who ate them really didn't stop them from fully embracing them. Proof of that is the big popularity that they still enjoy and the dozens of recipes that we have to prepare them. And ultimately, the ever so profound cultural idea that when and where there is no much else to eat, at least we will always find comfort in a bowl of beans. You say beans and I say etl. It is curious that while many indigenous names of valued foods have been adopted with few phonetic changes into other languages, like cacao that became cocoa or aguacatl that became avocado or aguacate, well, beans weren't that lucky. Thankfully, I am not the only one tortured by this linguistic mystery, and I found a study about the many indigenous names for beans in the New World. And it turns out that there are more than 226 different words associated with beans, and they are incredibly different from each other. Let me give you some examples. In Tepehuano, beans are called babi. In Zapoteco, Bisawi. In Totonacotong, they are Kanatstapu. In Tzeltzal, from Chiapas, they're called Chenek. And in Nabotl, they're called Etl. In South America, we find other words for beans, like Poroto in Quechua, Feijao in Portuguese, and some other countries call them Abichuela or Judías. Curiously, in French, the word haricot means beans, and it's very exciting because haricot comes from the Nahuatl word ayocotl, which is a traditional name for runner beans. Let me say that again. Haricot ayocotl. The etymology or meaning behind the names of some ancient indigenous settlements often associated with landmarks, famous rulers, deities, and also with the crops that people cultivated in those places. And I bet you see where this is going. And yes, many villages were particularly devoted to the cultivation of beans. And luckily, the ancestral origin of their names survived the test of conquest and time. And some examples of places where beans were cultivated are Etla, Ejutla, Etlatongo, Etlapa, and Etlantepec, among many other places. We will return with the show after this short break. Continue your journey exploring Mexico's edible treasures with my collection of ebooks Mexican fiestas, Mexican street food, Mexican chocolate, 
Puebla's Great Food Tour and my latest Mexican market food. To know more about my ebooks and start the making of your own traditions, go to pasdechipotle.com forward slash publications or click the link on this episode's notes. Go to pasdechipotle.com forward slash publications and get ready to cook, learn and enjoy Mexican food like you've never imagined. So far we have explored the history of the cultivation of beans and their botanical characteristics, and you know now some aspects of their cultural history and the many names they have been given. So I think it's a good time to flaunt the amazing nutritional value that beans have. After all, what brought us here today is the fact that they're such an important and delicious food. So let's begin by saying that All legumes, specifically beans, provide incredibly valuable nutrients that are essential for our bodies, like calcium, zinc, potassium, and iron. I told you that beans are grown together with corn, and they also make a formidable nutritional combo, because they put together lysine and tryptophan, two amino acids that together ensure a healthy development of our brain, very important, and immune system. Tryptophan alone helps the production of melatonin and serotonin, which regulate our sleep cycles, appetite, and even mood. Together with lysine, they help the neurotransmission of serotonin and niacin, a vitamin that can help lowering cholesterol and boost brain functions, among many other benefits. So, what does this all mean, Rocio? I know you're wondering. Well, basically, I'm trying to say that if you want to sleep fine, feel happy, think better, regulate your appetite and avoid an excess of fats in your blood, Well, you better start adding beans to your everyday diet to keep you happy and healthy. Now, how exactly are beans prepared? So, after beans have been harvested, they must be allowed to gently dry for several days by laying them under the sun and turning them every now and then while they are still in their pots. This will prevent them from drying too quickly and splitting. Once they are dried, they can be safely removed from the pots and stored. A very common traditional technique for cooking them involves soaking them before boiling. These will soften the skin and shorten the cooking time. And a very clever way to cook them that goes way back to ancient practices involves adding a solution of either tequesquite or ash to the water where beans are going to boil. This will tenderize them, making them extra soft and easing digestion. In other words, reducing gassiness. Now, I just said a big word there, and I bet you don't know what that is. And that was tequesquite. Tequesquite is a naturally occurring type of salt that has sodium chloride, sodium carbonate, and sodium sulfate. And it is absolutely safe to consume in small quantities. Tequesquite forms in certain types of lakes that have a particularly mineral-rich water. It is harvested from the shores of these lakes, where it forms a grey, thin, flaky crust, and it is commonly sold at traditional markets, meaning you will never find it in Walmart. So what you need to do is to take a tablespoon of tequesquite and dissolve it in a glass of water. Once the sediments have gone down to the bottom, you pour this water into the pot where you're going to cook the beans. Now, I already told you about the ritualistic dish called etzali and how it didn't survive to our days. However, we do have quite a few of such ancient dishes that are still part of many hyper-local cuisines here in Mexico. And that is the case of a dish that was created by the Totonaco people from Veracruz. And the name is Taxwayajun. According to tradition, this dish is meant to form a connection with the universe and everything about its preparation has been heavily mythologized. 
Now, I need to clarify that the recipe we know today contains meat from animals that were brought into Mexico in the colonial period, but hasn't really changed the actual meaning and function of this dish. So it all starts with a sacred pot where beans are going to be cooked. The pot represents the cosmos. The beans symbolize the earth and the pieces of either pork or beef are meant to represent mankind. And above these ingredients, powdered chilte bean chile is sprinkled to represent the stars. Oh, and you thought you couldn't be poetic with beans. In fact, to this day, beans are present in such a variety of ways in our cuisine that they are part of more than 60% of our traditional dishes. No wonder why we hold the fourth place of bean production in the world. But, this is interesting, we not only eat the actual seeds of beans, we also eat the flowers, the pods, and later on I'll tell you about the medical uses of the leaves and roots of beans. But the actual traditional recipes that we have that contain beans or where beans are the key ingredient are so diverse that we have drinks, sweet and savory, soups, savory dishes like tamales, gorditas, tlacoyos, desserts, and even pastries. Thanks to the works of cultural historians, we know that beans entered the colonial diet very smoothly, and Spaniards really loved them from the beginning. And while you might recognize dishes like frijoles charros, frijoles de la olla, frijoles puercos, ground into a paste, or in creamy soups like I mentioned earlier, colonial experiments were, how to say it, quite adventurous. And I will let you decide for yourself. One of the earliest written recipes we found for preparing beans is from a personal handwritten recipe collection by a lady called Doña Dominga de Guzman, and she wrote this book in 1560, in which she captures the fascinating changes in the culinary revolution in which Spanish, Arabic, Sephardi, indigenous and African traditions shaped our cuisine. The recipe in question is to prepare white beans garnished with parsley, paste, capers, cinnamon, cloves, peppers, a paste of sesame seed, which I'm thinking it was probably similar to alioli, and olive oil. The dish sounds incredibly aromatic and actually not miles away from other Spanish bean dishes like fabada asturiana. Another recipe comes from a manuscript that was written by a friar, this is very curious, who was in charge of his monastery's kitchen. His name was Fray Jerónimo de San Pelayo, and he wrote this manuscript in 1766, and the recipe to prepare beans suitable for Lent goes like this. So he begins by giving us instructions to sauté some onions in lard. Then we have to lightly mash the beans so they can thicken, season them with epazote herb, parsley and mint, which is too many flavors if you think of it. And all of these are digestive herbs, which tells us that he might as well have been very aware of the risk of having a monastery full of gassy friars. <laughs> And he also provides us with some other suggestions to prepare this dish by adding garlic, saffron, cloves, and pepper. And actually that reminds me of something. Uh, it might surprise you to know that the common assumption that all Mexican food has to have cumin is an absolute lie. Having said that, it is also fair to point out that it was really thanks to the Arabic and overall Middle Eastern gastronomic influence that Spaniards developed a taste for spices like cloves, cinnamon, and yes, cumin, all of which were introduced to Mexico during the colonial period. And while we use them a lot in certain dishes, we don't use them indiscriminately. Make a mental note for that. 
As I hinted earlier, the bean plant is the gift that keeps on giving. And while modern-day Mexicans, myself included, are embarrassingly unfamiliar with the deep ancient knowledge of traditional herbalism, which is not the same as herbology, we will have to leave that to Professor Sprout from the Harry Potter universe. <laughs> And to take us out of our misery, we are lucky to still have the marvelous De la Cruz Badiano Codex, a document from 1552, which surprisingly doesn't live in Oxford or Florence, but in our very own National Library of History and Anthropology in Mexico City. And it is entirely dedicated to providing illustrations and very useful descriptions of the botanical nature of medicinal herbs and plants known to the indigenous world, along with the instructions to use them, offering the most compelling history of medicine of the new world. The Codex says that the juice of tender ayocotes or runner beans can't be used to treat eye infections. The roots seem to be particularly effective as a purge and dewormer, and the dried leaves were used to prepare infusions to help urinate and clean the kidneys. Other uses of extracts from the plant are described as an effective treatment to stop diarrhea and as anti-inflammatory. Now, just remember, I am not giving any medical advice here, so please consult your medical doctor before embarking on a bean cleanse. And since we're talking about medical things, I know you're probably wondering whether I will address or not the gas issues. And of course, I'm not going to disappoint you. So here it is, the big question. Why do beans make us fart? Will they make us fart because the starches in the beans contain certain sugars and fiber that our bodies really struggle to digest? And when these sugars meet up with the bacteria that lives in our intestines, they feed on them and produce gas. Gas that is, well, farted. <laughs> so technically, it's not our gas, but our bacteria's gas. Still curious? Here's a more thorough answer. According to Masters in Science and Nutritionist Amy Shapiro, these sugars contain a molecule called oligosaccharides. And sadly, not everyone is equipped to deal with these bad boys, because some people just simply lack sufficient enzymes to digest them. So we end up half digesting them, which causes gas, which causes bloating, and the accumulated excess carbon dioxide doesn't just evaporate, so it has to find a way out, and obviously there's only one escape route. The bottom line, no pun intended, is that you have to make sure that your beans are thoroughly cooked, and you can also use the help of many traditional combinations of herbs, which not only will make them extra tasty, they will ease digestion. So you can use toasted avocado leaves, fresh epazote herb, and hoja santa. As you can see, taking a closer look into a humble crop can take us into fascinating adventures and many layers of cultural history. So I want to close down this episode with some final reflections about the cultural significance of beans. A couple of years ago, journalist Denis Romero published an article about racism against Mexican Americans in the US and reflected on the use of the expression vina. And it seems that the earliest known record goes back to the late 1960s, used by presumably white Americans from California who reported using this word as a slang to refer to people of Mexican heritage. According to the United States Census Bureau, in 2018, the Mexican-American population represented 11.3% of the national population, making them also the largest minority group. Now, I am aware that addressing systematic racism and heritage-based violence in America is a whole different podcast. But the truth is, after the very complicated year we just had, and particularly in the US, I think there has been an important shift in cultural awareness, especially in a nation that views itself as the flagship of multiculturalism. And I think... This is my perception that to address these issues and have these difficult conversations, 
absolutely everyone must have a seat at the table to find some common ground and continue evolving. Mexican Americans are very much aware of their need to have their voices heard and their issues addressed. And this just goes to show that food today, just as in ancient times, will always be part of our political life as well as of our culinary discussions. Now, in terms of the historical significance of beans in Mexico, it is worth mentioning that while it is true that corn remains the most culturally complex crop, the renewed interest in our gastronomic heritage has made us question and evaluate how much we have explored and preserved the associated food knowledge that we have. The somehow recent multidisciplinary approach to food studies has allowed us to better understand traditional food ways through the lens of historians, ethnobiologists, archaeobotanists, anthropologists, gastronomes, and many other specialists, thanks to whom we can learn so much more about our cuisine. And we have way more elements to recognize now that beans, along with other staple crops, are fundamental to our gastronomic and cultural identity. The history of their consumption and cultivation reveals so much more than techniques. They really open a window into exploring the complex traditions of Mexico's ancestral cultures. And finally, I think what I take with me today from this episode is the notion of becoming a custodian rather than a user of this amazing planet of ours. And <laughs> don't be alarmed, we don't need to sell our houses and become radical hippie farmers to change the way we value all the factors that intervene in our cultural food systems. We just need to be more aware of it and make better and more informed choices. Thank you for listening. This episode was written and produced by me, Rocío Carvajal. The next episode of the show will be an interview with Mexican gastronomy expert and ethno-historian Dr. Alberto Peralta de Legarreta, with whom I will talk about the enduring culinary legacy of Mexico's colonial nunneries and monasteries, exploring the fascinating, intimate life of these religious spaces and the people that lived, cooked, and shaped the way we think about food in Mexico. Remember, I'm always around on Instagram and Twitter. And if you want to reach out because you have a lot of things to say, well, you can always send me an email to hello at pasachipotle.com. If you enjoyed this show, please help me get the word out because that really, really helps to keep the audience growing so more people can find it, learn and enjoy this project. And I have left a link on the notes so you can review the show on Apple Podcasts. And so I think that's it for me for today, my friends. Until the next time. <laughs> <laughs>